Hello and welcome back to part two of our look at cell biology. We are officially on the other side of the flip as we begin part two. Uh, and uh, today, or today, <laughs> in this lesson, uh, in this video, we're going to be focused on selectively permeable membranes um, and exactly how are these membranes regulated. Uh, and so there's there's a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. Um, first of all, when we define that term selectively permeable, remember that we're talking about membranes that have the ability to allow certain materials to move across the plasma lemma. Whether it's moving in or whether it's moving out, uh, there is regulation and control. The primary ways in which this can happen uh, there's a few. One of them is diffusion, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this here in a few minutes. Um, but uh, diffusion is not the only way in which we can have molecules move from one side to the other side of a cell membrane. Um, in fact, there are a couple other ways. We, we've got this idea of osmosis, which is a specialized type of diffusion, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more. There is facilitated diffusion, which again is another special case of uh, diffusion. And then we've got this totally different way of doing things, which is called active transport. Um, and the difference between diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion, and what we see happening in active transport is, is rather simple and straightforward. Diffusion osmosis and facilitated diffusion are all examples of passive transport. Now, what do we mean by passive transport? Well, Passive transport means that we're moving these, these molecules from one side to the other without the use of ATP. Without the use of ATP. So we are moving, we are moving the molecules without the use of ATP. P, adenosine triphosphate. Likewise, when we look at active transport, right, active transport is just what it sounds like. It is active. It uses A, T, P to force molecules across the membrane. All right now, um, what are some examples of active transport that we're going to explore? Well, uh, active transport inclu active transport includes things like endocytosis. Right? Endocytosis is where we bring molecules within the cell. And so, so endo means within, cytosis means it's a process of bringing into the cell. Right? Specifically we're referring to processes like phagocytosis and pino cytosis, which we will touch on um, towards the end of this video. But there's also something else that's called exocytosis, right? which is basically moving things from within the cell out. Right? And so um, what makes these different than diffusion osmosis and facilitated diffusion is that exocytosis and endocytosis uh, engages in the movement of molecules across a cell membrane 
through the use of ATP, through the use of cellular energy. All right. Now, diffusion, let's kind of jump back here because we're going to spend a, a good part of today uh, really looking at what is the passive transport mechanisms that are involved. All right. Um, and so within diffusion, right, the movement of molecules from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So molecules are moving, and these molecules are moving based off of the concentration of molecules. Think of a candle. Right? You light a candle, um, and you walk away from it. You don't smell that candle right away, especially if you go into another room. But as you move closer to the candle you start to smell and notice the scent of the candle. Uh, by the way, I hate candles as much as I hate cats. They're, it's like stinky, god-awful things that you, some of you people buy for whatever reason. Um, if I smell candles when I walk into the house, I know I'm in trouble. Um, that's, that's, like the, that's the warning shot. That's, that's how I know I've, I've done something wrong. Um, God, they just stink. They're horrible. Um, but you light this candle, right? the molecules that are being released from the wax, the scents that are being released from the wax, are in a heavier concentration right by the wick. Now, these guys are really close and tightly packed. Right? And, so, um, and they've got Brownian movement. These molecules are just kind of naturally vibrating from the energy that they have within them. Well, that energy is generating heat. And the closer those molecules are, the more that heat is trapped. And the more that heat is trapped, the higher the temperature. And the higher the temperature, the more activity. The more Brownian movement they've got, the more Brownian movement they have, the more heat they're generating, the more heat they're generating, the more temperature rises. The more temperature rises, the more Brownian movement you have. Whew. So what do these molecules do? Well, all of that energy that is now built up begins to force these molecules to spread out. And they spread out, and they spread out, and they spread out, and they spread out. And these molecules will move from this area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until equilibrium is reached, until they have equal distance of the molecules spaced apart within the container that they are holding. That could be your room. Maybe it's your bedroom, maybe it's the bathroom, maybe it's the kitchen, maybe it's the living room, wherever. Maybe it's the whole house. Those molecules will continue to move until they are equally dispersed across that space. Right? So that's, that's diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of molecules. Now imagine that this happens all the time within the body. Right? potassium, uh, chlorine, carbon dioxide, water. We've got molecules that are constantly moving from one side of the cell to the next, or from one tissue to the next, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Right. Let's take a look at an example of diffusion. All right. Um, in an aqueous environment. So in picture one here, you've got a, got a little pellet down at the bottom of the beaker of the water. All, right. All of the pellet molecules are concentrated right there. You walk away for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, you come back and you start to notice that the purple color of the pellet has now started to spread out within the beaker. All right. Diffusion is occurring. Molecules are moving Purple molecules are moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Right. The molecules, the purple molecules, are moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. You walk away and you come back 30 minutes later, and what you notice is now all of those purple molecules have now evenly spaced themselves throughout the entire beaker. So that's, that's diffusion. Right. Remember, diffusion is an example of passive transport. Well, another example of passive transport is osmosis. 
and I would say this is probably more the the most important of the passive transports I think is is osmosis that you're looking at right here so what is what is osmosis well osmosis is Um, the movement of water from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration, remember there's brackets there mean concentration, across a semi-permeable membrane until equilibrium of molecules are reached. The movement of water from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration across the semi-permeable membrane until equilibrium of those molecules are reached. That's osmosis. Osmosis is regulating concentration of solutes, not by moving the solutes. That's what diffusion is. Diffusion is regulating solute concentration by doing what? By moving the molecule. But what we see differently here is water is doing the moving. So if you've got two beakers, you've got yourself beaker A All right. and you've got yourself beaker B. Now beaker A and beaker B are identical. They might not look like it but they are. All right. And connecting the two beakers there is a tube. Right. And in the middle of this tube there is a semi-permeable membrane. All right, so this is a, this right there is a semi-permeable membrane. That's what that is right there. Now each beaker, each beaker has some water in it. And each beaker also has some sodium chloride in it. NaCl, NaCl, I'm just going to write NC. All right, you guys know what that means. It's, it's really sodium chloride. All right, so this one has some sodium chloride. And this beaker now has some sodium chloride. All right. Beaker B has a concentration of sodium chloride that equals 68% NaCl. Beaker A, on the other hand, has 12% NaCl. The question is, based on our definition of osmosis, which way will the water move? in this scenario. Will water move from beaker A to beaker B or will water move from beaker B to beaker A? So look at your definition and give that a thought. All right, so if we think about this, the question was, which way is the water going to move? Is the water going to move from beaker A to beaker B, 
or is the water going to move from beaker B to beaker A, keeping in mind that we've got ourselves a semi-permeable membrane. Right? We've got ourselves these two uh, beakers of water that are identical, same volume of water. The only difference is the concentration of solute. All right. And if we look at our basic definition of osmosis, right, osmosis is the movement of water from an area of lower solute concentration to an area of higher solute concentration. So based off of that definition, you should have answered that question by saying water is going to move from beaker A to beaker B because beaker A has lower solute concentration than beaker B. So this water in here is now going to move up. Water is going to move this way and then what's going to happen to the water level over here? It's going to decrease while the water over here increases. What is the advantage of that? The advantage of that is you're not moving salt molecules because the salt can't cross the semi-permeable membrane. The semi-permeable membrane is too selective, doesn't let salt cross, but it'll allow water molecules to cross. So what have you done to the salt concentration on side A? You've reduced the water, but not reduced the concentration of salt. So you've increased the concentration of NaCl. Maybe now, maybe this is, I don't know, 32% NaCl. And on this side, what have you done? You've added water, which means that the, sal the salt that was there now has more water to interact with. So what does that do? Well, that lowers the salt concentration. And so now maybe side B maybe is at 32.6% sodium chloride concentration. Right. You've reached equilibrium. Your concentration of solute molecules are equal. Is your water equal? No. Water is not equal. Right? Water is not equal. Um, but your, uh, your saline concentrations are. Now, the movement of water, the movement of water is what we define as tonicity. Direction that water moves in response to solute concentration is called tonicity. Right. And tonicity has three different possible outcomes. Now, you've probably all have heard of these three varying types of outcomes. Right. Have you ever heard of hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic? Right. These are tonicities. These are three scenarios that will describe how water is going to re to, as how these are three um, um, scenarios that will describe how water will move in response to solute concentration. Right. So let's let's give you let's give you an example. We've got a cell, and the cell. It's a normal happy cell right here. All right. And it has 0.9% sodium chloride. Now, let me be clear. 0.9% is normal saline for a cell. 0.9 is normal. All right. 
So all of our cells, I should say all that, the majority of our cells have a internal saline concentration of 0.9%. The environment that the cell is in, the environment that the cell is in is actually a little bit more. It's 1.3% sodium chloride. So given this, which way, which way is water going to move? Is water, is water going, going to move, to move from, the from the cell to the, to the environment? Or is the water, is the water going, going to move from the environment to the cell? To the cell? Very good. Very good. So you should have, should have said... said Based on our, our definition, water, water is going to be an area, area of lower solid 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 concentration, concentration to an area, area higher, higher solid, solid concentration. So, so water, water is actually, is actually going, going to move, move out, out. And when the water, water moves out, out of the cell, the cell, the cell shrinks. The cell shrinks because water, water is moving out. 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 Alright? Water is water moving out. out. Water moves out. Right? And in fact, we say that the cell has undergone crenation. Right? The cell has undergone a process called crenation, where the cell shrinks due to the loss of water to the surrounding environment. Now, what does that do to the cell? Well, we lose water within the cell, so that drives solute concentration up but it also lowers the solute concentration in the surrounding environment so that you reach equilibrium. Right? Again, this is all about reaching equilibrium. All right? This is all about reaching equilibrium. So hypertonic environments force water to leave the cell, which causes the cell to shrink, and creonation occurs. All right? What about a hypotonic solution? With a hypotonic solution, here's your happy little cell. Right, again, 0.9% sodium chloride in the cell. Right, but this time, this time, the surrounding environment is at 0.4% sodium chloride. So what happens here? Which way is the water going to move in a hypotonic solution? So in this example, in this example, water is actually going to move into the cell because again, Water is going to move from an area of lower solute concentration to higher solute concentration. And very often what will happen is as water moves in, right, as water moves in, you actually increase pressure on the cell membrane and can lead that to rupture. Right. And when that does, we refer to that as lysis. Right. So you'll see the term very often like with red blood cells, hemolysis. That means that the red blood cell has taken on too much water and is now ruptured. It's split. All right. And so that would be a hypotonic environment. That would be a hypotonic environment. Now, what about isotonic? Well, isotonic is going to be 0 0.9 on the in inside. All right, the surrounding environment is going to be 0.9% as well. What happens in this scenario? So in this scenario, in this scenario, 
water actually moves in and out at equal rates. Water moves in and out at equal rates. It is what we refer to as um, no net movement of water. All right. So in other words, water is moving, but it's moving in and out at the same rate. So there's no change. You're maintaining solute concentration. That is isotonic. All right. Ironically, when uh, you're outside and you're running, or if you're sick and you're maybe vomiting a lot, or you've got diarrhea, all right, your tissues are losing masses amount, uh, a mass amount of water. Your cells try to overcompensate that by releasing water into the tissues to try to keep equilibrium in balance. Well, what does that do? That causes your body to become dehydrated. And so when you go to the emergency room and the ER doc says, orders you a bag of fluid of saline, did you ever, have you ever looked at that bag of saline? Saline is 0.9% sodium chloride. If your cells are dehydrated because they're trying to overcompensate from all of the vomiting and sweating and diarrhea that you're engaging in, then the doctor prescribes you 0.9% saline. Your concentration in your cells are what? Through the roof. They're elevated because your cells are dehydrated. They're giving up water to the environment to try to go ahead and regulate and preserve homeostasis. So your cellular concentration might be as high as 2 or 3% sodium chloride. Here comes 0.9% saline. Water is going to move from an area of low concentration to high concentration. That water is going to be absorbed by the cells to do what? Regain homeostasis. This is why they will almost always give you saline when you go into the emergency room. If you're not dehydrated, if your cells are not experiencing crenation, and you are perfectly hydrated, what's going to happen? Nothing. Isotonic. You're just going to pee it out. Fascinating, isn't it? This slide here just kind of reviews for you what we've just got done talking about. So you can kind of pause the video if you would like and uh, take a look at that. Make sure you've got that understanding down. Right. This here shows uh, just again this idea of permeability across a uh, semi-permeable membrane. All right. Um, so both sides of the tube here, just like my beakers in the beginning of the of the lesson, both sides of the tube have the same amount of water. All right, but check this out. All right? This side has less solute than this side. All right. Now in this example, in this example, what's moved? Well, yeah, the molecules moved on this example. All right? That would be an example of pretty much diffusion. But look at this one. Right. Same scenario, but here the solute particles cannot cross the membrane, but the water can. Right. So this is an example of osmosis. This is diffusion. Water's not moving, the molecules are moving in order to reach equilibrium. But over here, what is doing the moving now is water. The molecules cannot pass across that semipermeable membrane. And so they have to stay right where they are. All right. Okay, almost done. I got like three more slides. And this video is in the books. So facilitated diffusion is diffusion with a twist. And so you can see there with the definition. You can see the definition. Uh, facilitated diffusion is the movement of a molecule uh, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Bam! That's your definition of diffusion. With 
a carrier protein. So we've got a carrier protein, which is basically a type of integral protein. It's an integral protein. And this carrier protein, not using any energy, aids in the movement of molecules from one side to the next. So we're still moving molecules, which is why it's diffusion. But facilitated, to facilitate, to help, to support, to guide. This protein, this carrier protein, helps to guide the molecules from one side to the next without the use of any energy, which is why this is still considered um, passive transport. Now remember, this is the third type of passive transport that we have looked at. All right. So what happens? Well, um, we have our rubber ducky inner tube, and in comes a house sparrow, and the house sparrow lands on the head of the rubber ducky inner tube and immediately destabilizes the rubber ducky inner tube. So much to the point that the rubber ducky inner tube tips over and the house sparrow falls into the pool. All right. And then what happens? The rubber ducky inner tube resets itself and it resets itself for the next house sparrow that's going to come and try to land on its head. All right. It destabilizes the protein all right. and that protein, that carrier protein is then going to tip and it's going to drop that bird down into... The, uh, into the, the water, right? Now imagine that this is just a protein with some molecule that is attached to it, right? On one side, the molecule is closed. On the other side, the molecule is open. The molecule binds, and then it switches places. For those of you that are visually just not seeing that, which might be the majority of you, right? here's... Here's the cell membrane. Here is the carrier protein. And here's the molecule. It binds. All right. Then what happens? Is the carrier protein. changes shape, the molecule is still on the inside, and then in the third image, the carrier protein opens up. Carrier protein opens up, and when it does that, it releases it releases the molecule. All right. It's just basically what you saw with the rubber ducky inner tube. All right. That is facilitated diffusion. All right. It is diffusion with assistance. All right. It's diffusion with assistance. So here's simple diffusion over here in A. Things are just going to pass through the, the cell membrane. All right. But here's facilitated diffusion. Here's your carrier protein. Carrier protein is open, molecule binds, and then in the next picture, the molecule opens and it releases, or the uh, the protein opens, and it releases this molecule. All right, and this is then this is what we refer refer to as channel mediated. Um, so, with a another type of integral protein are protein channels, all right? and these protein channels are always open. And so things can just flow through them at high rates of speed. Right? Whereas carrier-mediated uh, proteins, it's one at a time. One comes in and binds, and then I close, and then I open and release the protein. 
then I reset, and another protein binds. Whereas with channel mediated, all right, it's all just flowing through. And then you have osmosis. All right, and then you have osmosis, which is again going to be the movement of that water based on solute concentrations. Right, based on solute concentrations. And then this slide here, there's one slide that I'm going to deal with that's uh, on um, active transport. And you can kind of read, uh, you can kind of read here the, the difference between phagocytosis and pinocytosis. The, the short of it is phagocytosis is bringing in some kind of solid material from outside of the cell to in. Pinocytosis is m the movement of water from outside of the cell in. All right. Um, and, and it does that, again, through the forming of these vesicles. So you can see right here, right, uh, this is the cell membrane that is wrapping itself around the particle. Right? Here is the cell membrane that is wrapping itself around the droplets of liquid. And what does it do? Well, the, the cell membrane actually pinches off the cell membrane pinches off and it creates this vesicle and the vesicle is now going to transport either the solid material either the solid material in or the liquid material into the cell all right um, receptor mediated endocytosis again to bring it in simply means that something binds to the receptors and it's the binding to the receptors that's going to drive this this uh, this motion inward. All right. Um, the key here again is to know that phagocytosis, pinocytosis, exocytosis, receptor mediated endocytosis. These things are called active transport because they use cellular energy. They use a t. P. And that's the end of video two. I will catch you on the flip side as we start video three, uh, which is we're going to be changing gears now. We're going to start looking at the processes. All right, we're going to start looking at the process. So we're actually going to talk about DNA replication um, in the next video. All right, guys, catch you on the flip side.